So U.S. ranks last among 46 countries in trust in media, Reuters Institute report finds. Let's read the subheading. It says the U.S. ranks last among 46 countries in trust in media. That's worse than Poland, worse than the Philippines, and worse than Peru. 75% of those who identify as being on the right thought coverage of their views is unfair. This is a national media problem, not a local media problem. Local news fared better than national news. Yeah, so a few things to say about that. One, I would guess that Republicans trust the media somewhat less than Democrats. And I'm curious to see how uh, how big the difference would be there. Obviously, Republicans have Fox News, but outside of Fox, cable news tends to skew center or left, and, which is part of the reason that Republicans are more likely to not trust the media because they, they can only really point to that one major cable news network that vaguely reflects a conservative viewpoint, whereas folks on the left can point to several several channels that more or less reflect a, a somewhat at least center left viewpoint the other thing the, the other part that's interesting about this is the the decline of local news local news i even remember when local news was a bigger deal in america than it is today and i think it was an even bigger deal 50 years ago before i was born than, than it was at the time of, I, I was born but uh a, a lot of people have talked about and analyzed the effect of the decline of local news local news feels very close to people it, it um it's you know, a local newspaper is able to make sense of things in a way that people more easily trust. Whereas national news, because you're dealing with more people, the narratives get more abstract and they feel less familiar and um, more alienating for that reason. And as as local newspapers have died out throughout the country over decades and been replaced by um, national newspapers and, and national news channels, you definitely see this sense of being alienated from, from the news to a bigger to, to a greater extent. One thing that is worth commenting is the uh, America's situation is not like the situation of Poland or Peru. I mean, we're we're a country of over 300 million people. Uh, we're one of the few countries, one of the few, if only rich, very large countries in the world that has welcomed immigrants for hundreds of years from all over the world, from completely different cultures, and even tried to make that work, right? Most European countries have never had a pretense of incorporating diverse cultures or viewpoints into their national identity. In America, we've actually tried to do something that almost no nation has attempted because it's it, it just seems too impossible, which is to let people from all around the world come here by the millions with totally different religions, totally different viewpoints, and somehow create a national identity identity that's not synonymous with an ethnic identity. In that context, it's much it's much more difficult as a news outlet to report the news in a way that isn't polarizing. If you're if you're from a country where n over 90% of people are the same ethnicity, have sort of sort of the same ethnic and national story, vaguely look the same, there aren't you know massive differences in appearance between people. It's it's uh and there's only, you know, say 50 million people as opposed to 350 million. It's it's uh it's it's much easier actually to create a media that the population trusts because the population is less heterogeneous. So with these kind of things, they they're it's much more interesting to me to look at American trust today versus 50 years ago than it is to look at uh, American trust and compare it to to places where so many other variables are different that I'm not sure you can actually draw the kinds of conclusions that people would want to draw. Like there's a unique problem with with American media for instance. And another interesting part about this is the fact that of the 11 outlets that reported this this poll in the in, in the first place, 10 of them were on the right and one of them was in the center and none of them were on the left. And it's not as if this poll is coming from a right-wing source that would explain that skew. Reuters is as far as I understand pretty respected in a, in a bipartisan way. The reason people are reporting this on the right and not in the center and on the left is because people on the right have far less trust in the media. Uh, you know, the cable news media outside of Fox News has has a left-wing slant. You know, a, a big feature of American media right now is, and American culture at large, is that the right has certain advantages because of America's electoral college system. Uh, the way that our political system works, it's not as if every person in the country truly has an equal say in what happens. And, and it's not actually true that each vote is is worth exactly the same as another vote. And when you look at that landscape, you tend to find conservatives overall tend to have 
advantages in, in the electoral system that make, in many cases, their votes on average you know, worth more. Um, but the, 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 the opposite is true, you know, in, in the mainstream culture and in, in the mainstream media, it's the, the, the political bias is reversed where um, the, the, vo- the, the, the left wing voice has much more weight in mainstream American media on television in commercials and Silicon Valley social networking platforms that have become like the the plumbing of our culture, you know, the just like the the internet infrastructure, all all of it has a left wing skew. So it makes sense that folks on the right and right wing media outlets are more interested because they resonate more with with the fact that they don't trust the media. It feel that the media seems biased against them because on the whole it is. So Brexit, food and drink exports to EU suffered disastrous decline. And subheading food and drink exports to the EU were 15.9% down on the same period last year. Meat and dairy products have been the worst hit. Labor says that the figures, quote, blow apart the government's myth that trade disruption is a temporary issue as the UK and EU adjust to new rules. Yeah, well, it, it seems to me the argument for Brexit, there are certain people that never wanted to acknowledge the downsides of, of Brexit and wanted to paint it as if not only are we going to get control of our borders and no longer be subject to the whims of the EU and be able to decide a, as as Brits what we're going to do with our own country, but also somehow this is going to benefit us economically in a in an amazing way. And you should always be suspicious when someone sells you something that literally has zero costs. Right? There are, as, as Thomas Sowell says, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Solution is, is something that benefits outweigh the cost is that there are literally no costs, pretty much don't come in life. Obviously, being being tapped into trade network of the EU is arguably the best argument for staying in it. And, it, and it's you know, your position on Brexit, Brexit, a lot of it is going gonna, is, is gonna to come down to how you weigh the benefits of, of having an autonomous national immigration policy and, and certain other policies against the, the costs of not being effortlessly in the, the European trade network. Yeah. And another interesting fact about this is that no one on the right reported this story. Um, obviously, the people selling Brexit all on the right are interested in downplaying the economic consequences of it and, and selling it as if it's not only good for national autonomy, but also a, a good economic deal for Britain. Um, that's a it's a disingenuous way to, to sell it, right? Obviously, it's it's going to be very embarrassing to to right wing news outlets to admit that uh, that that this decision has, in fact, in a very predictable way, damaged Britain's economy. That doesn't mean you have to be against Brexit. It, what it means is that you have to actually have an honest look at the costs and the benefits and come up with an argument for why whether it's actually a net good or a net bad. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I stand on that, but it's no surprise that people on the right are, are, are shying away from, from reporting this pretty embarrassing fact for them. Okay, so fines for Russia, Apple and Google by not deleting Mr. Navalny's app. And subheading, Russia's state communications watchdog warns Apple and Google to remove app. The app was created by allies of jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Navalny's app's uh, Navalny's app promotes his smart voting strategy to support candidates who are most likely to defeat those from the Kremlin's main United Russia party. And here, here you can see the 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 news coverage skew is to the right, or so it's. Or actually, no, this one seems pretty much right down the center. So th- this seems like people are equally reporting this story on the left, uh, the right, and the center, which is it's always nice to see that because it suggests that at this particular moment in history. Our position on the the lack of democracy in Russia right now is has not yet been infected by partisan bias on either side. Uh, and w- with Russia, you know, th- this is one of those interesting cases where, at different moments in recent American history, being anti-Russia has been a position of either the left or the right. Obviously, in the Trump era, to be anti-Russia painted you as on the left because of. Trump's seeming ties to 
various Russians. Before the Trump era, to be a, a Russia hawk was very much a position of the right. And I think it's it's always very instructive to look at these issues that just over the course of 10 or 15 years flip their partisan valence. Another one of these is sort of just isolationist, uh, isolationist foreign policy. If you're an isolationist in 2005, quite likely you're a Democrat because you're opposing Bush's war in Iraq and so forth. If you're an I- isolationist in the Trump era, then you might you, you may very well be a Republican. And and so it's into there there are certain issues where the right and the left seem to stay more or less stable over the course of you know, 40 years, like like abortion, for instance. But there are other issues where the valence can flip and and it, or, or it can sort of disappear altogether. Right? It's like it's like unclear right now what it means to be a Russia hawk or, or how how you would be read as a Russia hawk in the in the American political uh, scene. Okay, so blood on his hands. Republicans say Kabul explosion result of Biden decisions. Two explosions have been let off in Kabul. Reports of multiple fatalities have come from Kabul with a total so far of 13 people, including children. Ex-Good Morning Britain presenter Piers Morgan has taken to Twitter to share his opinion on the incident, claiming President Joe Biden has victims' blood on his hands. So here again, obviously, the right is is going to report on this more than the left. No surprise here. You know, I think to say someone has blood on their hands is is basically an automatic reaction by the other side when we're talking about uh, people dying overseas. And I think it's just important to remember that each individual case is unique. You know, like what whether whether this these particular you know I I don't I haven't looked closely into these particular explosions. And I think I can comment more generally on on Biden's absolutely horrible, uh, horrible technique of his pulling out of Af- Afghanistan. I can totally support pulling out of Afghanistan. And I, I, I tend to find myself definitely in, in support of, of leaving. But the way that Biden did it by first getting, getting rid of all of our credible threats of violence against the Taliban, and then without any leverage, trying to haphazardly evacuate the Americans that were there and the allies that have helped us prosecute this war for almost 20 years, um, and then ending up abandoning many people that were that we you know we came into their country and asked them to fight with us on the promise and and on on our national honor that we would we would be a nation of our word and then to to have a totally ass backwards plan for the for the evacuation is i think going to be a permanent mark on Biden's legacy and it, and it should be that said you know you you always want to look at whether this specific um, explosion is on on Biden's hands in particular, right? Is this by the Taliban, in which case it becomes more plausible that it's on Biden's hands? Is this uh, by ISIS, in which case you sort of have to look look at the specifics? Is it by another random terror group? I, I'm always hesitant to to bandwagon in in such a situation, but it's it's also totally possible that the, this explosion is a direct result of of Biden's decisions. Okay, California looking to pay drug addicts to stay sober. Um, that's kind of a hilarious headline to me. Okay, let's 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 look at the subheading. Governor Gavin Newsom has asked the federal government for permission to use tax dollars to pay for it. It being the program to pay drug addicts to stay sober. I assume the federal government has been doing it for years with military military veterans. Research shows it is one of the most effective ways to get people to stop using drugs. A similar proposal is moving through California's Democrat-controlled legislature. So this is interesting. I have I have not heard about this, and somehow my first reaction is is that it it wouldn't work only because the incentive the incentives to stay sober already involve money implicitly, right? If you're if you're a drug addict, very likely you can't hold a job, um, and and very likely in some way, shape, or form you're significantly poorer than you would be if you weren't a drug addict. In addition to that, there's just like the cost of getting drugs. So it's like it's already implied in most drug addictions that you would be wealthier if you could stay sober. So the notion that you could formalize that incentive structure by paying people to stay sober and somehow that would change things. 
I don't know, but if, okay, uh, I'm, I'm curious if this is an evidence-based approach that my, my, it's possible my intuitions about this are just not true. So let's read on a little bit. What reading that article proves to me is that it's possible to find a, p- a few people that have stopped using drugs this way, but the overall logic of it, there seems to be something flawed at the core of it. If you think that drug addiction can be cured by paying people, it, it, it seems to misunderstand the psychology of drug addiction in a fundamental way. Like if you're a drug addict, you know you could probably make way more money if you manage to stay sober. That's part of the reason why normal people try to not become drug addicts is because with serious drugs, it's an expensive habit that prevents you in most cases from holding down work. So the notion that you could just pay people to stop using drugs, it seems like um, kind of a category error. It's like, could you could you pay someone to stop having an affair with someone that was, you know, that was like a, like a passionate affair, for instance, maybe if the numbers got crazy enough, but for the most part, I think it's a, it's a category error to think that you can motivate people with money in an area of their life where fin- clearly financial incentives are not what they're thinking about. They're, they're, you know, you're hitting such a direct pleasure center of the brain. Um, you know, like how, how much money could you pay someone to not be in love with who they're in love with? Again, you might be able to find a story where it works, but it, it seems kind of to, to miss the point in a way that makes me pretty skeptical that this, that this program would be worth the money. And uh, it seems, it seems like there are just the incentives to game the system for, for drug users would be sky high. And uh, there, there seems something, there seems to be something deeply naive about it. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, though, to me that people on the right, right wing news outlets aren't so much reporting on the story because it, it seems it seems like just the kind of naive and radical idea that a lot of people on the right would rightly be skeptical about. You know, it, it doesn't seem to me obvious that this kind of thing would work. So but again, possible my intuitions about drug addiction are are wrong and that you can actually pay drug addicts to stop using. But I I don't know. I think I kind of think I wasn't born yesterday and I've seen a lot of drug addicts and I've known people with drug addiction and it really seems to misunderstand the the kind of uh, the, the kind of psychology they're dealing with. You can't even motivate people to stop using drugs with the threat that the drugs will kill them in many cases. Like the the threat of an overdose death, basically anyone who's ever done fentanyl is facing the fact that if they get the dosage slightly wrong, they're dead. And this is now common knowledge. Everyone knows this because of how many people have overdosed on fentanyl by by getting the getting their desired doses dosage wrong by what like a factor of not even two. So the notion that you could you could seriously get people to stop using drugs by paying them, which is a way less an incentive than avoiding death. There seems to be something so kind of idiotic about it. Maybe it's only f- intended to be used for lower level addictions to, to sort of medium level drugs as opposed to the, the the hardest of the hard, but there seems to be something, I mean, my God, if the incentive of like, like if you're addicted to meth for a while, it means probably everyone in your life knows you're addicted to meth. Um, it has physical consequences. It has social consequences that m- would matter to people far more than a, 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 you know, a couple extra hundred dollars a month. It's like, it, it just, th- this seems to so, it, it, se- it seems to be such a naive idea ripe for abuse and, and um, gaming that it's, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that it works at all. And I could see how maybe it might work for veterans in particular, but not be generalizable to drug addicts on the whole. So there's a lot to think about for that, but that's my initial reaction. U.S. Supreme Court declines to block Texas abortion ban. The hallmark of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence has been an effort to take the abortion issue seriously. Texas law added a new wrinkle to the so-called heartbeat laws that have become standard fare in conservative states, she says. Texas has tried to avoid a confrontation with Roe and Casey through its private enforcement scheme. Yeah, so... As as a as a pro choice person, I I cannot celebrate this policy choice. The the demand for abortions by women in Texas for whatever reason is 
is going to be exactly what it is. And, you know, to make it harder for them to get those abortions seems to me a, uh, a huge policy error. Now, I don't, I don't celebrate abortions, right? I think the vast majority of abortions are a case of bad decisions. There's rape and sexual assault, and you'd have to be truly crazy to not allow an abortion in that case. Although some people on the right do seem to be crazy enough to to want to disallow that, uh, but even in the more mild cases, you're you're talking about you know in some cases a person's entire life trajectory changed by uh, you know this this irresistible urge that we all have baked in us, and uh, it's it's very very difficult to sort of just derail your life by having an unwanted pregnancy, you know, a life that has been, that has been, you know, carefully thought out and and planned in some cases. And, and just to say that, well, all the momentum of my parents and community fighting to give me an opportunity, some kind of opportunity, I'm, I'm going to halt that and just pivot because, you know, I slipped up one night and had sex with someone, had unprotected sex with someone that I, I, I'm, I'm not ready to or don't want to be involved with for the rest of my life. You know, to, to make it harder for, for women to make that decision, I think is a, it's, I think it's, it's a mistake. And of course, you know, I, I as a pro-choice person, I find many of the pro-choice arguments are actually sidestepping the true issue, right? It's th- there's this sort of constant drumbeat of my body, my choice, which I think is a it's actually not the best pro-choice argument because we're not just talking about a body. The the only reason that abortion is controversial is because there's something in, inside of you that, you know, left to its own devices will become a full-fledged human being. Like, let's just sidestep the semantic arguments about when life starts and so forth. You know, every everyone can admit that left to its own devices, a pregnancy naturally terminates in, in another human life. And we all implicitly, if we want to be alive, we all are happy that we were not aborted. And that that matters. Like, that's part of the moral equation here. And the, the my body, my choice argument sidesteps that by by implying that just like it's my my choice to get my ear pierced it's my choice to like terminate what might what will soon be a life i think i think the pro choice side has really made an error by sort of getting married to that empty slogan at the same time even recognizing that uh you are terminating what would be a future life you have to take into account the fact that you know people are in a situation because of you know very very understandable errors where you have to choose between the life path you've been moving towards your whole life and a totally different life that puts you in the mode of a caretaker with with someone you may or may not you may or may not want to live that life with and the the quality of life differences you know like like the the diminishment in the quality of your life that might result from a particular pregnancy coming to term that's that's not a small deal that's a very big deal so i'm pro choice i'm i'm sad to see that texas has made this decision at the same time i think if uh, if this is what most of the people in the state of texas want then i'm not sure there are actual strong constitutional grounds on which to say they can't have it you know like the 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 jurisprudence the jurisprudence of roe v wade is actually in in some way quite sketchy it's actually not clear to me that the constitution actually does prohibit a state abortion bans uh, i think they you know th- there's a lot of stretching of meanings in order to get to that result with Roe v. Wade. But the net result of that stretching is something that I, as as a, as a pro-choice person, celebrate, which is that it's easier to get abortions, which again, women are going to keep wanting normal, psychologically normal, good women are going to keep wanting abortions uh, until the end of time. And that that's to, like to, to make it harder for them to get it only increases the burden to their lives. Um, in some cases, in, increases the, the health risks to their lives. Uh, you know, pregnancy is already a very fraught thing for many women with health health issues. And I, I would hate to see a resurgence of the proverbial back alley coat hanger abortions of the pre Roe v. Wade era. So, so that, that's my reaction to that story. 